Well, welcome back for another video Bible study as we are continuing through the book of Matthew and specifically through the life of Christ. And today we are continuing with the Lord in the temple court on that Tuesday prior to his crucifixion. And it's in Matthew chapter 22 that we're going to look at this morning. And the Lord here is questioned by both the Pharisees and the Herodians regarding uh, should they pay tax to Herod. We'll look at that, and uh, but first we'll just have a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your word, and thank you for the privilege that we have to open your word, and we just pray you would guide us in it. And Lord, just help us to be honest to the word of God and to appreciate what Christ does for us today as a result of what we learn here. So Lord, thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, we've been looking at the Lord in the temple court, probably on the Tuesday uh, before his uh, crucifixion. And he had already been questioned by the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who'd come to him, asking him the authority. And then he gave them those three parables. But he's still there. He's still teaching on this day. It was one of what's called the busy days of the Lord. In other words, there's much in Scripture recorded about all the things that he did on this day. And while he's there, he is surrounded by these two groups of people, the Pharisees once again, but now we are introduced to a new group called Herodians. And they came there specifically to try to trick Christ and to find some legal reason or political reason as well um, where they can charge him and bring him uh, to the crucifixion. So let's uh, open the Word of God now, and uh, we'll turn to Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 15. And this is Jesus and his request to pay tax to Caesar. And it says, Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. It's very interesting because it's very clear what they were trying to do is trick him up, make him say something that they could use in a court that would cause him to be found guilty and they could crucify him, they could punish him. Now, they didn't find anything, of course, so they made up charges, they lied. We'll look at that later, but specifically now it says they tried to entangle him. The word entangle means snare him, catch him, put him in a trap. Uh, find some way to get him in a situation that no matter what he said, they could accuse him. And it says, and they sent their disciples to him. Notice the Pharisees didn't directly attack him anymore here. They'd been beaten up already pretty bad, both with the authority question with John the Baptist. You know, why did you not listen to John the Baptist? And then, of course, he gave those three parables, the last one being the parable of the wedding feast. And in those parables, he humiliated them, made them realize that they were the ones that were guilty and that God had deserted them. And now the kingdom of God has moved on to those people who would receive him. And so obviously they didn't want to confront Jesus anymore. So they send their disciples. Um, and it says, and they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Now, let's talk about these Herodians. What are they? Who are they? And uh, where did they come from? Well, unlike the Pharisees, who were religious leaders and a uh, religious uh, group of individuals, the Herodians were more politically oriented. Um, and they were obviously, because they're called Herodians, they're followers of Herod. Now remember, Herod is not a singular person. Herod is a family, dates all the way back to the Maccabean period before um, the New Testament starts in that time between the Old and the New, when the uh, Maccabeans ruled, and then out of them came, obviously, eventually, Herod the Great, and Herod the Great would be the one who would rebuild the temple that they're in right now. And then there was all these other Herods going right through to the questioning of 
Paul later on. Now, if you want to learn more about the Herods, I did teach that in one of the previous uh, video Bible studies, but I'm going to give you the link now because what I did is I took my notes on the Herods. It's in a PDF form. It's up on the website for you to download and keep in your notes and use when you do your own Bible studies or even as you do this week. So here is, I'm gonna put up right now, here is the link to it. Uh, so just go to your web browser and type in gracebrockville.com, download Herods, all in lowercase, download Herods. And uh, you'll download that PDF and it'll give you a very comprehensive understanding of all the Herods that are mentioned in the New Testament. And uh, these people here who were questioning Christ were followers of the Herod family or the Herodians. And so who were they? Well, they were not religious, unlike the, Fer the uh, Fer uh, Pharisees. Rather, they were political. You have to remember that the Jewish people were under the rule of Caesar. They were under Roman occupation. But Rome couldn't send their forces everywhere constantly, so they installed puppet kings who would do the bidding of Rome, and they would give these kings authority to execute uh, certain authority and rules and carry out laws within their own land. And the whole Herod family were that. They did have authority. They could uh, take someone and have them executed, but they were ultimately under the authority of Rome, and taxes that were collected were sent back to Rome. Now, there were a large group of Jewish people who were non-religious. They were just, like today, they were just secular Canadians or secular Jews. Uh, they had a history of religion in their families, perhaps, but they themselves were secular. They didn't care about anything about God. Now, the advantage of following Herod was that you had protection. And so before this whole Roman domination and, and Roman rule, there was so much chaos within the land and civil war. So when Rome came in, they brought a very harsh but true uh, level of authority and execution to anyone who disobeyed that authority. So there were a large group of people who said, we're glad that Rome's here. We're glad that Herods are here. We're glad that we're under their authority because it gives us peace. And it was mainly those individuals who were business owners, who wanted to have rule and who wanted to have the safety to carry out their businesses. And so the Herodians were more of a political party who were following the authority of Herod, who himself was a Jew, but under the authority of Caesar in Rome. And so these Her Herodians, these Herod followers, were despised by the Pharisees. The Pharisees saw them as a living example of authority over the Jewish religion. And so normally the Pharisees would have nothing to do with the Herodians, nothing to do with them. They despised them because they were followers of that opposition that they were wanting the Messiah to free them from, okay? But for this instance, it seems they decided, let's get together with our enemies, those individuals that we would never have any contact with and, and, and literally despised, but we have a common enemy because Herod wanted Christ put to death as well. We know that from Luke chapter 4, where it's warned that Herod was after Christ. And so both the Herodians and the Pharisees decided to set their differences aside and make a pact to try to trick Christ or literally ensnare him or entangle him. Now, they devised a very crafty situation. It was well thought out, this proposition they put to Christ. 
they were going to ask him, should we pay tax to Rome? And it was a very well thought question. I'm sure they spent a lot of time thinking and devising all sorts of different ways to uh, attack Christ and find a question. And finally, they settled on this situation because they felt there was no way out of this question. If he was going to answer, then it would entangle him. And if he wasn't going to answer, it would make Christ look weak and a coward in front of the Jewish people that had so admired him. So let's go back to the text here where it says this. And they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians saying, teacher, there's that common understanding, a rabbi, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. What a bunch of baloney. <laughs> that, that, that is ridiculous. They were literally trying to soothe Christ and trying to, to appeal to his ego, thinking that they would, you know, come at him and acknowledge his authority and then make him uh, unaware of the fact that they had set a track for him. Look what they said, teacher, we know that you are true. Well, that's a lie. They rejected his truth. They rejected everything about what he said. So for them to say that we know you are true is, again, just an absolute lie that they were trying to throw at Christ because they had rejected his truth. They had rejected everything that he had said to them. And that you teach the way of God truthfully. Well, again, they rejected all that. Christ had specifically said that in the last parable that he was the son of the king and that he was there to teach about his kingdom. The kingdom of heaven is like a wedding feast. So obviously they are just bringing forth all these statements that are lies. And it goes on to say, and you do not care about anyone's opinion for you are not swayed by appearances. Again, trying to uh, soothe the Lord and trying to make it sound like, you know, he's not intimidated by the Pharisees. He's not intimidated by the religious leaders. Um, and again, just as this hypocrisy that they're bringing forth to Christ. And obviously a very clear attempt to make him feel as if somehow they're on his side. They're doing the work with him. They acknowledge him and they're not opposed to the Lord. And then they hit him with the question, tell us then what you think. Is it lawful? Now, the word lawful means is it correct? Is it morally good to do what we're asking you? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Okay, so there you have the Herodians standing there listening, and the Herodians are just waiting for an answer because they are servants of Herod, and Herod is under Caesar's authority. So here were the options that they thought Christ had. If he says we should pay tax to Caesar, then the Pharisees would say you are rising uh, or trying to raise up, rather, you are trying to raise up insurrection. You are trying to turn the people to the Roman authority. You're not the Messiah. The Messiah would not follow Rome. And of course, if he did that, then all the people who are now following Christ would leave him. If he says, do not pay tax to Caesar, then the Herodians are just standing there going, well, now we have a legal case. He is trying to cause a revolt against the Roman authority, and we can go after him for that. Now, it's very interesting. When you read Acts chapter 5, uh, there was that story where Peter was put in jail, and they wanted to kill them, and Gamelia, who would be the, the, the individual who would later on um, lead 
Saul, who would then become Paul, Gamaliel rose up and told them about an individual in Acts chapter 5, where he quotes this. Let me just read this to you. Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. Now that's Acts chapter 5. In that whole story, Gamaliel is saying to the other Pharisees, leave them alone. If it's of God, you can't fight against it. But if it's of man, like this Judas of Galilee, who tried to attack the idea of paying tax to Rome, well, he disappeared and Christ would disappear too. And so would the Christians disappear if it was of man. But he brings up this instance of this man called Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing. In other words, there were other people before Christ who tried to revolt against the Roman taxes. And they raised up people who would fight against them. But they were all disappeared. They all, you know, dispersed and probably their leaders were put to death. And so the argument that Gamaliel would make in Acts chapter 5 is, these guys come and go, uh, and Rome will take care of them. But if it's of God, you can't fight against it. But it's just interesting that he noted an individual. And they were hoping probably that Christ himself, if he said, do not pay the tax, he would disappear like this individual that is mentioned in Acts 5, uh, Judas of Galilee. So the other option was that Christ would say nothing, that Christ just keeps his mouth shut and says, I decide not to answer. Well, again, that would make the Lord look weak. So here they are, these two groups of people, and they thought, just answer, do we pay tax to Caesar or not? And certainly they thought, we got him. No matter what he says uh, is going to be either rebellion against Rome or rebellion against the people and the Jewish law. So he can't answer. But in the wisdom of the Lord, he does something very unique. Look what it says. But Jesus, aware of their malice, in other words, he, he knew, he saw right through all of them. Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, ye hypocrites? Interesting, eh? You hypocrite. Christ was not shy in calling out these individuals. Why? Because they were not there to help the people. They were not there to do anything godly. They were not there to do the will of the Lord. They were there to cause trouble. They were there to destroy the faith of those who were seeking God. And so the Lord stood nose to nose with them. Uh, and, and uh, you know, light, rightfully so. And so he calls them out. He calls them, you hypocrites, you hypocrites, because you don't live godly life. You don't obey the law. You're trying to, you know, point things at me when you know right well this is a trick. So he says, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. Now, there is the key wisdom here. They just wanted a verbal answer from the Lord. Yes or no. Do we pay the tax or not? Just tell us yes or no. But the Lord in his wisdom says, show me a coin. Now, remember, the coins of Rome had a picture of Caesar on it, but the coins in the temple did not because they could not bring an image of Caesar into uh, the temple courtyard to, uh, you know, pay, the, pay uh, the sacrifice. That was what the whole purpose of the money changers were. They would take the money from uh, the world outside the, the temple area, the common money, and they would they would change it. And so the fact that somebody had a coin with Caesar's image inside the temple showed indeed that, you know, even there, there was some level of corruptness because they, sh they shouldn't have had one. But these Herodians 
happen to reach into the pocket or go somewhere. And sure enough, they found a coin that shouldn't have been there in the temple. And they had one and they brought it to the Lord. And so he says to them, show me a coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius, which would be one day's wage for uh, a soldier or even a laborer. That's a one day's wage. And Jesus said to them, whose likeness and inscription is this? Holding the coin up so everybody could see it. And they said, Caesar's. So the Lord now wonderfully turns the whole situation back on them, making them answer the question, and they have to reply, there is no other option. Well, it's Caesar's. And then the Lord said to them, therefore, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled and left him and went away. Now, what is interesting is the response. They marveled. They thought he would say something that would accuse himself. However, what he did was just simply say, render unto Caesar, give to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar's, and give to God the things that belong to God. Now, what was the Lord saying by saying that? What was he indicating? Well, he was just simply saying there are two realms. There is the physical realm in which there is a human king, and he administers human laws. He has a, he has a uh, limit on what he can do, but he has authority. And since we live under that authority, and since ultimately it is the authority that God has put in place and God has allowed, then give him what he requires. But in the same way, render unto God the things that belong to God. There is a spiritual kingdom. There is an authority from heaven that is different, that is not temporal, that is eternal. And we are called to give unto God the things that belong to God and keep the things of the world separate because ultimately the things of the world perish and fall away. Now, in doing so, the Lord is ultimately teaching us to give the Lord all the glory that he deserves. Give the Lord the spiritual um, praise and the spiritual attitudes and give him ourselves, give him all the things that God requires because it is an eternal spiritual kingdom, which is different and better and greater than anything human or temporal. But since ultimately we are under the authority of our rulers, give them what they desire, but give God greater because he's of greater authority, a greater kingdom, greater power, and he requires us to give him everything that he deserves as well. Now, this passage, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and God the things that are God, has been so misused. And I've heard it, I've heard it interpreted to defend both, you know, anti-vaxxers and vaxxers, you know, people who want to take the vaccine and people who don't want to take the vaccine, you know, it's just been pulled way out of context. The Lord was not talking about rebelling against our government. The Lord was not telling us that we need to stand up and, and you know, turn against our authorities. There is a place that is going to come, perhaps. I think the Apostle Paul, or sorry, Peter, when they were taught in Acts chapter 5, even here, the passage that we looked at earlier, they were told not to preach the gospel. And they said, we must obey God rather than man. But we're not there. Um, we're not there. And to take this passage and to use it as some sort of civil disobedience as Christians, we are not justified scripturally to use it in that way. 
Rather, we are justified to use it in the way that we need to be obedient to the Lord and give Him all that He requires of us, both of our hearts and our attitudes and our desires and our motivations and our strength. Render unto God the things that are God's. In other words, all the spiritual things that the God requires and the things that the Lord has provided to us were to give to Him and not hold back and not to you know, mix uh, our love for the world with our love for God. We're to give Him all the glory and all the praise. And so what the Lord did here was just to establish there are two different levels of authority. We live in a fallen world, yes, and ultimately the authority over us has been established by the Lord. You know, Romans 13 tells us that. And we are to live in peace with all men and to obey our king, as Paul would say. However, we're to boast to give God everything that he requires of us as well. So let's make sure as we approach this Sunday that the Lord is the focus of all that we do. He is the focus of our day. He is the focus of our, our worship, our spiritual life, and that we do not neglect anything that the Lord requires of us because we're supposed to give him the best of everything we do. All right, so let's prepare for worship on Sunday. And to that end, let's make sure that we really do come with an expectation of giving God everything that we're capable of giving him. That means we don't come cold to church. We come warm, ready, desirous to worship him in an attitude of giving him the glory and the honor that is due to him. All right, Lord bless, and we will see you on Sunday.